Hello, this is Jeremy Hung from Hung's Electronics back with a video on the ADP5470, specifically talking about the professional applications. Legal disclaimers, the opinions expressed in this video are my own and not of my employer, university, and that even of Hung's Electronics. These are all my own views as an individual. Once again, this unit was provided by Digilent. They are sponsoring this video series. So. Once again, this instrument is very, very awesome. The clear thing is value, right? I'm going to talk about a lot about value with this, right? And uh, I'm going to kind of brush over like some of the other specifics with scopes, like memory depth, and I don't know, like, right? Like this isn't a USB 3.0 scope. It has Ethernet, so like, right? We can do some high-speed functionality and such, but. Uh, Again, right, like just, just as a scope and then a logic analyzer out of the box, you get quite a bit of value just from that. And uh, especially if you have a laboratory where it's just like one scope, one very, very high end scope that your engineers are fighting over. Uh, yeah, so this is something they'll probably look into as far as uh, maybe trying to, um, I don't know, give all your engineers separate scopes and then they can work from their offices or even from home and that's uh, something I might even talk about a bit and gonna just very talk generically about work stuff because right I work for a company can't say sign an NDA don't want to divulge any proprietary information and such right that's just just a bad idea professional applications. So what are we actually going to cover in this video? So I'm going to talk about specifically rapid prototyping, board bring up, checkout, and debugging, and some very particular cases with working from home with this instrument, consulting work potentially, and of course just I guess with the previous points more like the general like oh what if you had this in the office or in a lab at work and I'm going to talk about specifically how compared to other instruments on the market especially ones that I uh, am used to you can end up basically for the price of three of these guys or even two for like the 500 megahertz model you can buy a Tektronics or Keysight scope of the same bandwidth and similar like auxiliary functions, right, that you're paying for without even paying for keys and options out of the box. So that's kind of a big deal, uh, of course. So I'm going to talk about that. And uh, once again, uh, I'm going to try to do show and tell in this video. So, right, I made the mistake on my last video that I got carried away with more tell than show. So I had to make those separate videos. I had to go back and then make a demo video, which turned out actually pretty okay for academic applications. And on uh, this one, we're gonna talk about specifically two demos basically um, are gonna be the main focus where I have a Arduino set up here, an Arduino Mega, so uh, specifically set up to emulate a lot of like digital buses plus uh, it's controlling an I2C um, clock generator, right? The infamous uh, Silicon Labs 5351A, uh, love that clock gen, uh, and uh, yeah, we got that driving an LCD and stuff, and then um, the other one is uh, particularly in the case of some dev boards, right, so like, right, analog devices, dev boards, um, I happen to just have this one because, right, it was a part that I wanted to demo a while back, um, but uh, never got around to it, so this is a LTM8080. Uh, it's a step-down silent switcher micromodule regulator and uh, this thing takes anywhere from 4 to 40 volts in and then outputs uh, What like two two uh, yeah, two two outputs of 3.3 in this case is what this is configured. So we'll put that to the test um, again like uh, This uh, benchtop um, unit right they again the ADP 5470 has the integrated power supply integrated MSO all right, specifically with the analog channels, right, rated on this model at 350 megahertz, that's going to come in handy all in one testing required to check out a dev board like this. So, right, what I'm already kind of forcing even before, right, demoing, like I'll need a multimeter, I'll need at least two channels on the scope to measure the input and output. There's also a case there where we might potentially even measure 
right noise just cursory glance at noise and then just kind of look at other other interesting parameters as we go so as far as other applications right one very good feature about this device in particular is right power supply has that integrated current and power monitoring which i'll demonstrate something i haven't really tried before is the pass fail uh, automated testing features in, in the really any of the digital end products i'm not really a test engineer or a test automation engineer as people would call it or really involved in QA or QC processes. I'm aware of those processes, but that's not particularly my specialization. I'm more of a you know, forward design engineer and a hardware reverse engineer, so uh, um, that gets into some interesting spe uh, specific topics that we'll talk about in this video as well. Particularly right with this uh, Arduino demo, it is kind of meant to show generically like the capabilities of the MSO, so right, time correlating, of logic analyzer channels with the four channel oscilloscope. So right, with the Arduino demo, we have three channels out of the four just uh, dedicated to monitoring all three clock generator outputs and then seeing just kind of how those work. And then um, the fourth channel we can use for like debugging and stuff. I've already done this uh, um, the other night when I was trying to make this thing work. And uh, th this isn't a hundred percent still. Um, there's also some weird stuff with, uh, I believe with just how either I wrote the code or right in a rush, some of the buses don't work as intended. So we'll, we'll potentially look into that. All right. So now the next demo we're going to go into is going to be with the Arduino Mega. Okay, in this demonstration of the ADP5470. Um, again, we got the Arduino Mega uh, putting out all these dis different digital protocols as well as uh, controlling the SI5351, which is outputting a, uh, what is this, like a 10 kilohertz uh, um, square wave or something. We can actually measure that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, 10.706 10, 10 kilohertz is what this is set at in all channels. Um, and again, right, we got, let's see, uh, if I can do add time base here to, we got hello world being displayed out on the UART. Um, again, we got, yeah, we can see I squared C right, um, spy bus is active on both of them. And, uh, yeah, so that's kind of just how that goes. And then it's like, if we're not interested in this, we can switch over to switch over to JTAG, so actually let's trigger off the clock pin, and then we can just do a single, yep, and here we go, we got our uh, JTAG activity, um, and then now we got, we can do this on SWD, which should trigger yeah, there we go. Okay. Actually, let's reset the time to there. And, whoops, let's ignore this. So we got that. So again, you guys get the idea of this just working. Yeah, there we go. Let's go back to this demo. Um, for the offset, so we fit everything on screen, change this time base a little bit to get to see the hello world message. Yep, so there we go. And once again, to make these time correlated measurements where, right, like I'm trying to measure off the clock edge here. So let's see, hello world. It's like, wow, look at that. There's your deltas and everything. And 
same goes for, again, from digital domain to then, of course, just, oh, do I want to correlate with this? Do I want to correlate with that? We could, we have option, options there. And so that's just basically a simple demo of how uh, MSO functionality works on this instrument. Again, how you set these channels is, right, when you add, you designate your channels in here. And uh, of course, these are all from some Arduino code I generated uh, right here. And then this is just the pinouts that I have for all these. And uh, I mean, it's pretty, pretty much it. So uh, on with the rest of the video. Okay, linear tech eval board. They we're gonna bring up this board. We're gonna see what it does. So here. All right, so now we're going to try this demo out where we have the LTM8080 step down silent switcher micro module that we're gonna try out here. Um, so now we're gonna try to feed it. Uh, yeah, I guess, right, we have 25 volts we could play around with here. And uh, let's let's try this out. So uh, first, we're definitely going to need the scope. Um, oh, this is from my previous setup. Uh, let's see. I'm going to have to close that. Hold on a second. Oh no. Oh wait, I might just have to restart the video. Oh, I mean, okay, there we go. So first, we're definitely going to need the scope. We're going to need power supply for sure. Uh, we'll have the DMM uh, in its own window that will, oh wait, whoops. I think I need to somehow undock that. Oh, let's see. Or uh, where, did, where did you go? There you are, okay. I'll have to make that its own window. So we'll get back to that later. Um, and then now, uh, what else do we need? I think those are the only three instruments we need. So right, so uh, we're gonna provide an input of, again, let's try, well, I guess we'll might as well try 25 volts. Uh, yeah, we're gonna monitor outputs with some BNC cables directly. Um, I'm gonna make sure that I have this all set to, yep, okay, so these should all be set to one meg. And now, Time to shuffle some stuff around. So we're multimeter leads. Okay, so now we'll do this. And then let's see. Okay, I yeah, will use this guy for, or actually not this guy. Um, we will use Probably, oh yeah, here we go. My leads from the previous video. All right, we're gonna need to do plus and minus. All right, so now let's untangle that. Okay, now what else do we need? That would be, okay. So, I believe we just need some BNC cables, which I got a bunch back here. Okay, that'll do. Doing another short guy here. Do we? Do we not? Um, hold on a second. Oh, goodbye. Let's not. Let's not do that. Let's see.
Oh, I just realized I'm using valuable. Okay, hold on a second. If the video cuts off here for some reason, okay, let's, that's gonna suck, but we will once again play this by ear. Here was a short, another short one. Okay, cool. So now we got that plugged in here, that plugged in there. Okay, cool. Now, okay, okay, nice. This is just ground. This one's just voltage. So now, what else do we need? I don't think we have to load this down initially, but we'll see. Um, Let's clear, oh actually, we don't need this guy. We definitely know, don't need this guy. Oh wait, whoops, these. Uh, we'll disable both of these. Let's start out at, what did I say? Let's try and max out this and then, uh, might as well try uh, 500 milliamps. Yeah, there you go. And then um, check our scope channels here. Run. And then make sure that these are scaled up because I think, right, oh, we should have one volt per division. Okay. Wow, would you look at that? We got, again, there's 3.3 volts. Uh, let's see, what's the scale of this guy? Oh, that's right, that's, yeah, 25 volts, and then current is one point, okay, okay, it's varying, but it's in the milliamp range. So that's pretty cool. Uh, let's see, um, uh, one in the instrument that this guy lacks is definitely a, um, uh, DC load, but, uh, I mean, I don't, I can't name it all in one that has a DC load in, in integrated into it. So, uh, it's a very specialized instrument, right? As it turns out. Um, so anyways, uh, now just for, right. Let's just, as a sanity check, check, uh, whoops. Let's first run the multimeter. Would you look at that? Oh my gosh, they're both 3.3. .3. How about that? I love just when that happens. Um, okay. Now. How do I want to do this? Um, well, simple one we can try first is... Uh, okay, so cool. Okay, we got that. Um, we can go back to here. Um, let's see, what do I want to do? Um, let's see, I want to load this down somehow. Um, I'm trying to think of a good way to do that besides, of course, using my DC load, which is over there. It's the Siglin SDL 1020X 200 watt DC electronic load. Um, so we're gonna try to interface with that. Okay, let the iPhone do its thing here. So, okay, now. Uh, the question now is, do I have adequate banana cables? Oh, that's right. Yeah, I think I do. Um, yeah, okay, cool. We'll try to get this sorted. So first, let's turn the power supply off. forget if this actually has... A hole for nope, it does not. Okay, that's fine. Um, 
Let's see, so now we're gonna set this to, uh, let's try, or actually, let's try to record this. Okay, basically with my DC load, oh, ow, ooh, ouch, that hurts. Um, we're going to try and do, how's that? First, let's get this probe up. Again, this is not gonna work easily. Um, okay, if I only had a way to, uh, what did I use last time? Um, no, I definitely did not use those, but if I can find a way to clip on these to here, that would be great. Let's see, again. I mean, right, I could just do this, but. And that just kind of leaves me with, oh, whoops, let's do these this way. Okay, we're still recording, okay. So now. Um. Let's say I want to draw, okay. Let's say I just want to draw 100 milliamps. Okay, that should be good. Um, I guess I could just manually hold these. Uh, let's see. Reset the camera here, okay, now. What I'm going to do now is we're going to spin up the power supply and then, oh, uh, let's see, do I have to make sure that this is on or off? I think I do. Okay, now. Oh, whoops. Nah. The nail plug just immediately fell. So, now. There we are. So we're drawing 0.33 watts there. Okay, cool. So now, interesting, we should look. Uh, or at least the interesting thing we should be looking at is uh, the FFT. So let me do this one more time. Oh, whoops. Maybe this wasn't the most optimal setup. I should have. Prepped ahead of time here. Let's see. Noise floor doesn't considerably go up or anything, so that's not particularly interesting. But uh, let's see, we can stop this. We can go to Spectrum Analyzer. Uh, we just want these traces, and then make sure that these are all. Oh, whoops. Uh, yeah, full, okay, 1x, 1x, okay, cool. And then let's start a span, or actually let's stop frequency to like 50 megahertz, yeah. Or whoops, not 50 millihertz. Oh, hello. Um, there we go. Okay, annoying, but got it. Let's 
So what I'm hoping to see here is kind of a spike to see where um, if we can capture any switch mode noise here, but uh, obviously I'm not seeing any. Probably because the noise is pretty spread out on this. Uh, so that's cool. You see that uh, we don't see a single like spike or anything, right? That's like down here. Um, so that's pretty neat. So uh, that at least is what I wanted to see with this demo. So I will end it here. All right, now you've seen two demos. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of my own experiences and where I would have loved to have had an instrument like this. The first one is uh, in bringing up an ASIC. So right, application-specific integrated circuit, right, literally a custom chip or a, a custom rock, as I would call it sometimes, right? Um, <laughs> uh, so back at a uh, job, uh, I want to say three, three years ago, we had a custom ASIC made. We didn't, uh, to save on cost, we didn't do the whole automated testing and binning of these parts. So we kind of put that on ourselves to do that in-house. And so one of our software engineers developed a test suite to test out each part of this ASIC. Uh, I was the point man and just kind of doing that one by one, which was really cool. Like, right, I was, it's an experience that definitely uh, needed. I kind of find ASICs kind of fascinating and also that there's also that risk, right, that if you don't get something right, that the, literally the mistakes are set in stone, which uh, we'll get into here. So without being too specific, so it's an ASIC that was built in a modular way where each uh, block, so there are like either like four or five blocks in this design, were powered by their own independent voltage supply or VDD pin, right? And so checking out each one of these blocks, okay, voltage is nominal, current draw is nominal, like right, kind of establish a baseline. For some reason, the last block in that chain, or just uh, one of the last blocks in the, the ASIC, uh, was one, drawing too much current, uh, voltage rail was sagging, and uh, it was pretty evident that this was a short, as well as the fact that I think the internal temperature reported on that block was pretty elevated so uh again all the all the key signs of a, a short somewhere and uh, uh checked out the board that we had made didn't there wasn't a, there wasn't a problem with the design um as it turned out i okay so gave some feedback to my superiors and even contacted the contract asic manufacturer and as it turns out it, uh the program that they were using, which again, I don't know what, if they were using Cadence or some other uh, layout tool, or I don't know what the tool chain is from the proprietary realm. I, I know at least what Tiny Tape Out uses now, but I don't know what the full like proprietary chain is. That's a whole um, can of worms, so to speak, of uh, lots of things, of lots of patchwork and uh, integration and tools, right, put together to make that work. But um, as it turns out, on the mask, right, so the, the mask is the, like, master design that it's, like, uh, they'll make masks, or, right, there's this uh, sheet of glass that has the pattern etched onto them, and then for, like, the photolithography process, right, uh, just to briefly explain, right, photolithography is one of the more common methods, if not the method, to make chips, and uh, for, mul like, right, most chips are multi-layer, so each layer you have a glass that basically you're shining uh, laser light through a light to, uh, what was it, to expose a pattern, right, onto the chip, and then, you know, right, you have that photoresist and all that etching process, right, um, um, just in so many words, that's how that works, but uh, anyways, if you make a mistake on the mask, that is a very expensive mistake, because again, the NRE cost, so right, the non-recurring engineering cost, the bulk of it is not only just the design work in itself, but the mask cost is substantially, like, right, a huge portion of that. Because, right, that's every chip that you make is using those set of masks. Silicon's cheap, right? Like, wafers, you can make them all day long and process them. But, uh, yeah, masks, not easily replaceable. Uh, 
And so, as it turns out, on the mask, they found that there was a direct short between like a VDD plane on that on that block to ground. And they were like, "Wow, we could like right." I remember. I think the comment was, "I can't believe we found it, but because it just happened to be in this corner, we we saw that, and there was like that's not supposed to be there." So, uh, they confirmed that, and then. Uh, the foundry that we were using uh, took it upon themselves to, one, take responsibility, to make a new set of masks, which is a huge deal. So basically for free, they completely uh, rectified this whole situation. And it was, that was, that was kind of nuts because I even I know, right, um, at that time I didn't even really know much about ASICs other than just, right, like just some general microfabrication processes from a course that I took many years ago. Uh, but I just know that the gravity of that situation was that mm, this is a lot of money. And so uh, in the meantime, cool thing they did was we sent a bunch of these chips back. They used a focused ion beam, right? So literally like a particle accelerator to blast through uh, the short. And uh, we used a couple of those chips to, at least in the meantime, uh, use for our, and verify our design. Uh, before we could get the new set of chips in. So that was kind of a cool experience where, uh, right, ASIC is also board bring up, it's also debugging, and uh, a very interesting case study of, uh, wow, what happens if you make a mistake on an ASIC? Uh, it's, a, it's a big deal. And so uh, an instrument like this would have been really helpful, right, to isolate that quicker, because, right, um, built-in trend logging and right um as far as just like documentation it is wonderful right because you have that uh again the trend plotting over time as well as just right the readouts and stuff that you could put like in a report would be would be awesome in like a professional setting because right documentation is everything and uh in, in my case right i think i just remember sending an email saying that oh these blocks were sent drawing this many milliamps and right, uh, it's nothing to do with the power sequence or anything. This is the baseline nominal. But then this one block was drawing pretty much like right, almost like right. You just as long as you kept giving it more voltage, it tried to uh, draw more current, and then the voltage would drop. To, and uh, it would be nice to at least see that right, like a graph or a plot of that happening. Another great use case, right? Hardware reverse engineering with this device is something that I could definitely see it excelling in especially like right that's kind of what i do right now uh having lots of logic analyzer channels helps a lot uh right i'm kind of used to now where uh you get a mysterious system or a chip or so right you get a mysterious system with a chip that has lots of pins you want to have a logic analyzer with as many pins as possible to kind of see how the chip works there are cases where you want to see what the what it's doing right um like how, what, what kind of uh sequencing it's going through or just like just just for like general like oh we have no idea what this does but we'd love to see what kind of logic is or what digital signals are flying on those wires right so um that's that's definitely a nice use case uh again this is very unique in its uh, class that it's competing with that it has uh, 34 channels, right? 32 plus two clock channels, very unique. Uh, almost can't put a price tag on that. Um, this is for both the 350 and 500 megahertz model. This is a absolutely great value for that capability in addition to right having the four scope channels. Um, Right, so as far as like just like also just right embedded design, I can kind of foresee that being nice to have because right, uh, especially right FPGAs, um, you'll have a test bench that you make for your design and software, right? But then you can also make one in in hardware in the real world with this, right? So kind of look at your in, ins and outs, and uh, that's that's at least why uh, at least more of the examples I could think of directly that where this really shines and excels in. Um, and again, right, as I stated before, uh, for the price of one Tektronics, Roden Schwartz, or Keysight's uh, oscilloscope, mixed signal oscilloscope, you can have like two or three of these in the lab or 
each each engineer has the in their office or uh in my case right um work from home right you can just send one of these uh to a remote worker and uh, that should cover at least 90 percent of use cases right because right there's always going to be that gap that exists in capability that it's always the very um the very niche use case where right you need more bandwidth you need more resolution, you need, right? Like, it's just, you're always gonna need more, right? For very specific use cases. And uh, again, that that's, that's uh, again, I can't think of like a perfect instrument, right? Like I've, I've had to, cause right, it's always a compromise where 90% of the time you're just looking at just like analog signals, like, okay, is this, like, right, like, you'll use the logic analyzer assuming that you know that the digital, I mean, there shouldn't be any, like, you lay out a board, you know that, I mean, there shouldn't be any mistakes, right? And you look at the logic states and, like, oh, okay, that lines up. And uh, you can find, what, like, weird timing errors. You can weird find um, just right, uh, just bad programming or just uh bugs that like right you maybe you set the bus speed too slow or something right like all those things you can do with the logic analyzer uh right it, where you get in the trouble with the analog domain right is where um let's say you have to add like pull up and pull down resistors there's like some additional capacitance you have to add or something like where just some weird like analog domain stuff that might affect the square signal the digital signal then that's when you would need the scope and uh Having that all in one instrument is really nice. That, that's that's all I can say. Um, let's see, what else do we need to talk about? Um, okay, now the other use case, right, and the kind of the last one I'll cover is uh, consulting work, right? So, um, I mean, right, you might have like a lab behind me here. Uh, like with with uh, multiple scopes, power supply, and stuff, right, and then multimeter. Um, but uh, if you need a more compact form factor, and I don't know, your your consultant that gets paid pretty well. I mean, this is this is a solution. Uh, if you're just getting started in consulting, uh, this is definitely uh, an instrument series you want to be looking at for sure. Um, again, uh, it's not portable but it is luggable like you can definitely put it in your luggage or in a, like a pelican or a hard hard case for travel and then uh you can bring it on site and you're right with an esd mat like a, like one of those like i fix it foldable esd mats you can have like a nice uh on the go setup uh, helping clients out with their problems right so um and right like again um once again, it's not the end all be all because right, it'll definitely have it'll help in pointing you, in most cases to a solution. If not, sometimes it'll just be right. It'll ninety percent of the time, it'll lead you to a answer or solution. But that ten percent, it's gonna lead you to oh, uh, looks like this might require higher bandwidth, right? And so now, you're gonna have to request like a rental or something, right? Or um, if the work site you happen to be at has some higher end equipment, that's something you look into, right? So that's, again, um, that's the thing with test equipment. You're always going to want more. This, this, I will tell you, will definitely cover 90% of my use cases. Again, um, that's why I have a one gigahertz oscilloscope, but even in some cases, that's not going to be fast enough. Cause right, as it turns out, there are some. Uh, just inherently with some EMI and EMC stuff, that stuff is all really high frequency up into like uh, even like right uh, getting near tens of gigahertz range. And uh, again, with the I mean, forget about modern computing and stuff like trying to monitor uh, like RAM and stuff, that's all very specialized, right? You're already going to be spending a lot of money trying to debug that kind of stuff, and uh, usually, right? I mean. <laughs> You're, um, if you're at that point, um, yeah, you're gonna, you're obviously gonna be charging a lot of money. And okay, so my phone keeps saying that I'm running out of storage, but clearly I have lots of storage left, so I have no idea what's going on there. Um, yeah. So, anyways, that uh, kind of concludes the uh, this video. Where right, bottom line is uh, 
This is definitely a series of instruments that I think professionals should really look into, especially for, um, I mean, right, as I, as I said, right, like remote consulting, it's kind of a no brainer that this is something you should look into for sure. Uh, for more of an office, like in lab setting, right? Um, if you're looking, if you're having a problem where uh, engineers are fighting over test equipment, this is a solution that, uh, let's say, end of your budget's coming around, you have enough money for one, hand, uh, one higher end oscilloscope or higher end uh, piece of test equipment that uh, might be in um, this, why not just buy an all-in-one, right? That's, that's, that's definitely an uh, option. So thank you for watching. Hopefully you found this video very useful. Next video, I'm going to cover DIY and hobby use cases. This is definitely on the very higher end of uh, the, the, that use case and that target demographic. So uh, that's probably going to be a very short video. Um, but uh, we're going to cover it nonetheless because, uh, again, it's something that I do also. So And I will definitely be using this instrument for those cases. So uh, see you in the next one.